Hey everybody, it is Richard Harrison, Scott Lease, and we are back again for another episode of the Surf and Sales Podcast. I am super excited um, for a couple of reasons. One, we have Rock Versace with us, um, and that's R-O-Q-U-E for all of those people who love to call him Roke. It's actually Rock. Um, the other, and we, of course, Scott's here with me, and, and the part that I'm most excited about, I don't even know if Rock knows this, um, I, I tease Scott with it. This is the first time I've ever known a person like me to be able to talk to two people who both hired and fired me. Oh, so, <laughs> that's the catch all. So, Rock, you know, and, remain, and remain cordial. And remain cordial, right? No, that it, it's actually a true story. Um, both those instances, I, I owe a lot to Scott and Rock. Scott um, gave me a shot back in 2008 when the economy was turning and I had to take a major step down and a step back um, and had to sort of rebuild my career. And that got me into sort of startup phase. Um, that company went from zero to like 7 million ARR in about nine months. And we went back down to zero ARR in another four months. So it was a, a fascinating story. Um, fast forward after that, a couple of other gigs along the way. And I, I met Rock at Mashery and, uh, and it's interesting because I remember our interview too, Rock, um, which we'll probably get into, but um, Rock took a shot on me and I humbly and gratefully am appreciative of that because it was my first true, true SaaS experience in my mind. Um, and then, you know, that company grew and eventually was going to get bought by Intel. They didn't need me. Uh, I, was pro I always sort of say I was lying, you know, 48 on a 27 line spreadsheet in terms of people they were going to keep. Um, they didn't need another sales ops person, but Mashery and Rock um, hugged me out the door, made sure my family uh, had some runway and not have to worry too much, which ironically is how I sort of became a consultant. So I, I owe a lot to Rock as well. So uh, it's fun to have you both here. I'm not going to I'm not going to pin you up against the wall and ask you uh, deep personal questions. But Rock, thanks for joining the show today. Well, thank you. And I, I remember your post mastery period when you would come in we'd meet every few months or so and you'd show me your dashboard and you killed it so yep. you did a lot better after you left mastery so i agree you know, i agree but i think you gave me a huge foundation which i appreciate so um with that being said you know let, let's dive into it rock is, is officially the cro at troops.ai um, while we're not here to pitch people rock we do like people to understand where your frame of reference is um, what is Troops? What does it help solve? What problem does it solve? Sure. So we like to say that Troops makes business software more human, right? And what do I mean by that, right? Troops, we, uh, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, we support continuous productivity by surfacing workflows and tasks and alerts from Salesforce and let people take direct action from them within Slack. And Got so, it. you know, I, I like to say to people, I use Salesforce.com last century. And I actually did before I joined Salesforce, I was at Broadvision and we were at the time their biggest customer. And, um, and it was a big, and, you know, it was just a, it's a total change, right? But back then it was just Salesforce automation. And now it's, you know, if you look at analysts and things, they call Salesforce infrastructure. They don't call it CRM really even anymore. And so it's become really hard for the end user to use. And you can look at tools like uh, Gainsight, or outreach and sales law. Well, why do they exist? They exist because Salesforce is this system of record, but BDRs don't want to use it. CSMs don't want to use it, but nobody's really helped SEs, sales engineers, or, or reps. And so that's what we're doing. And we're trying to do it in a, you know, kind of like a, a, a really sub, you know, quiet way as in we live in Slack. So you don't have to go learn another system. You don't have to take yourself out of the flow and go into another system and log on to, to get your work done. You can do it right from Slack. So that's kind of it. And we, in these workflows all fall under kind of different categories, like commit, you get a workflow to make sure you update your forecast coaching, you, you update your med pick and your manager gets an alert and, and can, can coach on your impact and the, and the metrics that you gained and the, and the champion notes that you've gotten or a celebrate, you've won a deal or you've set a meeting or the meetings happened and so you send an alert into a channel so that you can celebrate or connection. You know, when somebody does something in one part of the organization, other people often need to know. So if you're in finance and you kick an off that a rep thought was closed out because you didn't have the right paperwork, an alert going to the rep in Slack in real time telling them, 
hey, you need to go back, get the, get the purchase order or else you're not going to get paid. Those kinds of connected fibers are what we're trying to talk about in terms of helping everybody get smoothed along the way and, and make it more human to use the software and make it more fun and, and make it more productive. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Let, let's dive into who, who's Rock, right? <laughs> Rock, Rock grew up in Baltimore, if I remember correctly, right? I did. I was actually born in D.C. and my parents, as they, they went from being college students to working their way up, um, moved from you know, Southeast DC where Sugar Ray Leonard grew up to Baltimore to live with my grandmother for a couple of years and then into the burbs of Columbia and Ellicott City. Got it, got it. And, and sort of fast forwarding from there, you, you obviously you got, did you, I know that you served uh, in the first Iraq war and we appreciate that service, um, but did you go from high school to military or did you go to college first? Like how did that come about just for you? Yeah, I went ROTC and I was um, a lazy sophomore in college and they kept sending me ROTC scholarship stuff and I kept throwing it away and finally they sent it to my parents <laughs> and and my dad my dad gave me like four pieces he wasn't a big talker but there were like four things that he told me over my life that I always remembered one was to save for in an IRA he's like just put your money away in an IRA right away before you, you before you even see it and start to save for your retirement two he said major in whatever you want, but do me a favor and just minor in computers, because if you do, you'll never have to worry about a job. And this was in 1985. What, what, what year was that? 1985. Wow. wow. He was already telling you to learn computers. Yeah, and it was really great. I mean, you look at this, where we are now with everybody and, you know, hey, I feel left behind. I'm like, if everybody had my dad, they would not have been left behind. And so, and then the third, you know, there were a couple others, but the, the third one was he bribed me and he flat out said, I'll buy you a Bronco too if you, if you take this scholarship because it'll save us 30 grand and the car cost me 14. So to be really honest, that's what set me over the edge and made me do it. But it was, he was right. I needed it. You know, I remember taking my first PT test. I think I did 25 push ups and could barely finish the two mile run. I just become lazy, lazy college kid. And then by the time I got out of the, imp, you know, the, the airborne, I was part of the 82nd Airborne, you know, could do 100 push-ups and, and that kind of thing. It was that constant, and it wasn't like overnight. It was years, years of raised expectations from basic training to officer training to being in an Airborne unit to being in an Airborne unit where you're supposed to be the best. And, um, yeah, it was a, that was a great piece of advice. So that's what happened. I went to college, got my degree, and then went out and was joined the Army as a lieutenant and got to serve and in Italy. Just and you're, uh, if I remember correctly, your family has a sort of a, has been in the military for a while. It sort of runs in the, in the Versace family, right? Right. Grandfather and uncle were Lieutenant, uh, West Pointers. My father was enlisted special forces. My uncle, he was captured in Vietnam and held captive for two and a half years and then executed and was in 2002 oh posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. So we went to the White House. George Bush gave my dad the Medal of Honor. That actually, that picture of George Bush and my dad sits in the, in the George Bush Library in Dallas. Wow. I think it's in Dallas. And um, yeah, so if you Google my name, chances are you're going to get 500 responses of my uh, stories about my uncle who passed away over 50 years ago and then finally buried way deep, I think I am. Right. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a, it was a foundational story for the family, right? We, my, there were a lot of brave soldiers, right? obviously in Vietnam and all these other wars, but my uncle, if you could call it this, had the fortune of having his story kind of memorialized because another man named Nick Rowe was um, captured along with my father and he escaped after five and a half years and wrote a book called Five Years to Freedom. And in that book chronicled my uncle and, and his story. And, um, you know, that was really kind of a blessing. And then Nick Rowe uh, came back and um, in 1989, he was assassinated in the Philippines. And so he lives five years in Vietnam and then comes back and is assassinated. And then in 2002, during the Medal of Honor, my father had invited his widow and her two sons. And her two sons and I met. And we hung out. And we played basketball together. And his son was 13 years old, his younger one. And he had never met his father. And so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, that's that kind of like deep, deep stuff that you, um, that really kind of form a family. And, and so my sons are named Rocky and Nick after those two. I knew about Rocky. I didn't know about, I didn't know that's where Nick's. 
Uh, yeah, that's what Nick's, that's who Nick's named after. And, and, and do your kids have any desire to go into the military? And do you care? Do you? Well, my older one certainly doesn't. And my younger one just recently has been saying that he wants to be a Navy SEAL. And I'm like, where did this come from? And <laughs> so it's obviously in front of him. Yeah. And no, no, no. I, uh, my wife would kill me if he joined the, the military. So, but I, I have to, I have to be really careful. I don't, I don't want to impact his dreams, but I want to make him aware of the reality of what that would entail. Right. And, you know, you might have to kill someone, you know, that's not a light thing to, um, to think about, right. That's it's impactful. And just as a sidebar in college, I took this death and dying class and had to write a paper. And I wrote a paper on suicide in the military. And in 1989, I drove all the way down to the Library of Congress and I could find four pages on it. And now they're saying that 6,000 soldiers a year take their lives, right? And so you think back, how many, how many former veterans drank themselves to death or, or just went into a shell and, and were never themselves? So it's not just the soldiers you lose there, but it's the the hearts and minds that you lose when they come back too. So it's a really deep and important decision to make because that's, that can, that'll change your life. Yeah. How did, just out of curiosity, and, and I know we'll get into sort of, you know, software sales and stuff, but I think this is really fascinating. And a lot of times we don't get to have these conversations with people. Um, where, how was your transition back to civilian life? My transition back was easy-ish. I watched my soldiers, though, who were not college grads, come back and and try to find jobs and and you know figure out what their careers were. But I will say that you know I waited tables for a year because I didn't time it very well. And you'd stand there, and um, some guy would be in there with his date, being, and then you'd talk to him for five minutes. He's like, "What are you doing waiting tables?" And you're like, "I'm just not going to go into it." Right. And then I remember I met a woman and I met her parents, not my wife. And and they're like, and this was when I moved out to Monterey for the summer just to wait table. And she's they're like, what are you doing dating a waiter? And I'm like, you know, I just got done serving our country and I'm a veteran, and that's how you're judging me. So that from that perspective, there was a lot of swallowing your pride. And I think that that's that's actually a theme that I think that we should talk about all day today, not necessarily swallowing your pride, but understanding that not everything is a straight up trajectory in your career. And, and I had that a lot. Like, so when I got out of the military, you know, you're leading a bunch of men, you're, you have a lot of responsibility. I had my own Hummer and driver at 23. <laughs> and you know, I still don't have a driver, right? And I'm 50 now, 52. So uh, the rest of your career trying to get to a place where you do have a driver. Yeah. And you're, you're really doing something that you feel is pretty noble as a soldier. And so you, then you take a step back. And I went into grad school and for me getting an MBA was really like getting a BA. Cause I mentioned I studied computers. So I didn't know a thing about business. My father was a professor. My mom was a nurse. I didn't know anything about business. So for me, an MBA was really just a BA in business. And, um, and then I went to Accenture and I went to Accenture with the, at the same level as a college graduate. And it was 1994. And, you know, I thought people would want to hire for leadership, but people wanted to hire for what you've done before you went into grad school. So I started down again in, in Accenture and, and got four years. And, and you know, I, I, up until just a little while ago, literally in this, this year, when I realized that troops is really about change management and process change and understanding the as is state and the to be state that I realized it was these consulting years that I did at Accenture that actually helped me so much those four years. And I used to think that I'd never done the BDR role. I used to think I kind of cheated out of that because I didn't do that one year of cold calling. But what I did do is three years in the military learning that you never call in sick because they make it miserable for you if you do call in sick. And the next four years at Accenture, learning how to uncover pain and solve it. And so really that, the idiot that I am, I'm thinking, oh, gee, I got out of a year at being a BDR, but I put in seven other years to learn a lot of really important stuff that was, you know, really frontline, not management level work. Let's, let's talk. So I know you, you came out of that and, and you went from Accenture to Broad Vision, right? If I remember correctly. And then Broad Vision, you went to Salesforce, right? And Salesforce, this is, uh, as, as we were talking earlier, you know, literally almost last century. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, we could say, you know, 
two decades ago, right? Yeah. Um, and how early were you at Salesforce? Like, were you employee number 100? Like, were you- okay. Yeah, you gotta tell us the story of how you got hired. And, and yeah, that too. What the interview was like. Okay, so I was around two, 220 or so. In, I went to Broad Vision and our stock went from a dollar to 90 to a dollar during the dot-com boom and bust. And right. so, and I, and I was a VP at the end at Broad Vision, which was absurd absolutely absurd right and that, that was kind of the the, the dot-com bubble inflated titles all the way across and, and there i was and a guy named jim thanos who's my mentor to this day i know all of his kids his son-in-law um he was an amazing he is an amazing guy and he was an amazing leader and, and benny off and he were talking about him becoming um the head of sales at broad vision uh, at salesforce i don't know how far it got and, uh, and they eventually hired Jim Steele, which was a great move. But they got to know each other really well. And, and Thanos gave Benny off four people from Broad Vision that he really liked. And um, two of them were over in Europe. And there was me and Roger Goulart here. And, and so I went and met with Bro Mark Benioff in 2002 in May. And literally after hellos, the first thing he said to me was our top rep made $600,000 last year. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and I'm like, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but now I've never had a CEO say that to me since. And I've talked to hundreds, right? And so people, I don't know, really get how sales and business and operationally focused Benioff was. And so then I met with Mike Bash, Michael Bash, who became my first manager. And, and within five minutes of the interview, he says, I don't know why we're spending time talking because Mark already said to hire you. And it was largely off of, I mean, I met with Mark for five minutes, so I didn't say anything. It was all off of Jim Thanos' recommendation. And, um, and so they hired me and, and Mark just made a heck, heck of a lot of fast decisions, I would suppose, because in that summer of 2002, he built out the field sales team and a couple hundred people were brought in, doubling the size of the company pretty quick. One thing I'll say about Mark also is that I, I was just having lunch with Jim Thanos a few months ago, and he said, you know, months after you and, and Drew and Roger and Ariel started at Salesforce, I got a letter from Mark with 10,000 shares of Salesforce saying, you saved me a heck of a lot of recruiting fees, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, he oh, hired God. He hired a couple hundred people it, and he remembered to do that. Jim was blown away. And so I'm blown away. You know, when you think about that stuff, it's like I'm blown away that a CEO actually recognized that a head of sales was saving them recruiting fees and did something. It's not even the head of sales, though. This guy wasn't even an employee. No, he wasn't. He was outside of the company. It was a really oh, remarkable. Oh. It's just like these little things that you piece Powerful. together. Yeah, yeah. yeah but you're like, it's not an accident that Salesforce is Salesforce, right? I know everybody likes to so rag on So what was that like, say. though? What was, like, was it, you know... By the way, that's $1.75 million worth of... Um, yeah, I don't think he held on to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't want to bring that up to him. Yeah, it's, like, it's like the guy who sold, it's like the third guy at Apple who sold his shares for like 500 bucks, right? We've heard uh -huh. that. Story. What, what was it like in those early days of Salesforce? Was it, was it an easy sell? Was it a tough sell? I mean, was there even a process? And I know you, you're a process guy. Um, you know, what was that like as a sales rep back then? So I think this is a really interesting one because I've been dealing this with this lately a lot, which is, it was pretty, when I got there, it was around 20 million. And when I left in 08, it was on the track to get to a billion. And I look back then and we had just rolled out Enterprise Edition the, the spring of 2002, which was really what led us into the path of being able to work with big companies because you had that API. And, and so it was hard. And I came in first in the account management team. And I think this is a good lesson for anybody in, in business. And I tell this to all the people that come in to companies I work with, which is there were people at Salesforce like Brian Millam and Rob Acker and Brian Neefsey who, who were, you know, frontline managers. And, and they would come and say to Benioff, hey, we're not paying attention to our install base. There's a lot of money we could make in our install base. Give me 10 people and I'll drive $10 million in ARR. And 
And so it was that, and, and that was what Brian Millen did. And he got the account management team and I joined as an enterprise account manager and, and, um, and grew accounts. Right. And so, but that is a really important lesson because it's like nobody handed Brian that. And he didn't just say, Oh, I think we can do it. Give me people and stop. He said, give me people and I will make you money. Rob Acker did the same thing after we started getting big. He goes, we've taken our eye off the SMB again. Give me 10 people and I'll make $10 million and grows that team. And now Rocker, Rob Acker is the CEO of Salesforce.org. Brian Millen was president, is president of Salesforce for years now. And then Brian Neefsey went in years later and said he had gotten a presentation from uh, one of the partners in the financial services industry and saw how they had configured Salesforce. And he came back to the team and said, we have no idea how to sell the financial services. We need to partner. And if you give me a team, 10 people, we'll make $10 million. And then he built that financial services branch in corporate sales. So in the early days, it wasn't easy. You'd go into places and they'd almost, and buyers would almost Honeywell, American Express, American Express, they had like four levels of security you were only allowed to store level one data in Salesforce because we didn't have the security. We, um, we would almost get this virtual pat on the head. Yeah, we're going to use you now when the economy's low, but as soon as it comes back, we're going with Siebel. I'm like, okay, well, we'll live the fight that day. So it was not easy. I think that a lot of things did go in our favor. I think the fact that the economy crashed meant that people couldn't buy Siebel and Oracle. That helped. And this is this is 2003 economy crashing, not 2008. No, this is the 2000. This is the dot-com boom. The dot-com. Okay, I just, right? I just so, want to put some perspective for yeah, people. Yeah, budgets all got pulled away. It was bad. I mean, it was 2000, 2002. 2002 was really bad economy. And um, so people couldn't buy the big software. So Salesforce could, could get in there, which was really helpful. Um, the competitors like Upshot would... I remember walking through the airport and seeing dashboards on the wall and the integration with Outlook, and we would lose deals on that. But Upshot then got bought by Siebel and Ruined, and then Upshot was built on NT, which at the time, big companies didn't think was secure, so you could beat them there. You just figured out ways to win. But it never felt easy, and, um, and we'd lose a lot to Siebel. Um, I had the Pacific Northwest, so we would lose to Microsoft a bit. And after I left Salesforce in 08, a guy named Brett Gilbert would call me every six to nine months or so and say, hey, remember this account? We just want them back, right? All these ones that we lost eventually came back. So it definitely got easier, but it wasn't easy. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of interesting takeaways from that, but um, I wanna, one thing that stood out to me was, you said you were an, account, an enterprise account manager, and today you're a CRO. I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of listeners out there, myself included, would call that an unconventional road to CRO. Like I'm thinking about places where I've worked and people who are in you know, account management roles, customer success kind of roles. I don't think that they generally are thinking of their career path as one towards a CRO type place. So how, how, how have you navigated um, that? How did that, how did that happen? So enterprise account exec install base, it's a sales role at Salesforce. It was, right? There's, you had a 600K new business ACV number and a 2 million renewal number and you had 30 accounts. So it was sales. And it, you know, I, I think that my, I don't think anybody's gonna follow my career path. It's kind of random. I don't think it's been, I don't think I've, I, I never have had a, a, a really an idea of at 25, I know what I'm gonna be doing at 35 or 45. It's it's kind of a meandering path that I don't think anybody would follow. I mean, I've gone from soldier to consultant to product manager, uh, owning a product line to account manager to a sales guy. And I think that, that, that what helps with that is, and I think that one of the, in my position now, one of the main things is helping people understand what everybody else faces. Like if, if somebody in sales is doing something and I can say, Hey, you know, that's okay. But if you don't do it in this way, when we hand it over to professional services, they're kind of going to be screwed. Or if we hand it over to CSMs, they're kind of going to be screwed. Or this is why this is important to marketing, or this is why this is important to the product team, right? Just having that broad breadth of, experiences to understand you know you kind of like seek first to understand walking in other man's shoes or whatever it's that, I think it, that was really the most helpful part i think it's important that that people that people understand and, and hear that you know it hasn't been a, a straight line you know no and, and i went back down right so from 
from grad school, starting over at the bottom again, from, from being a VP and it, 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 um, broad vision to being an individual contributor at Salesforce. So, and, and look, I'm a, I'm a CRO at a Series A startup, right? I'm not a CRO at Salesforce. So it's a different level job. It's not like, um, I mean, this isn't, it's a hard job, but it's not, it's not incredible. It's not like neuroscience. It's, it's, neuro, you know, I'm not a neurosurgeon. It's just CRO and you, you have a breadth of experience and you hope you can help your team win and grow. Um, I, so I don't over, I don't, I don't think we should over, um, over, uh, overblow the the role that I have today it's a good role I love it it's fun what do you what do you what, do you, what, do you, what have you found that you love again about the the series a size company the early stage and the building something from scratch versus versus you know things that you love that you know such a huge company like Salesforce and broad vision and these kind of places I think there's challenges in sales regardless of the company you're at and there are different kinds of challenges right it, it, a, a series a you know the challenge is usually people don't know who you are right and you can you can get yourself in a twisted up in knots over gee if i just sold google i'd always be able to get that meeting and be able to go in and people would trust us right away and you know or if i was at salesforce or sap i could always get that meeting but but those those people that are in sales in those roles they're dealing with shrinking territories and, 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 you know, maybe not as much control over their destiny. I mean, if you're at Salesforce and you're the top, top strategic guy, you got maybe one account and hopefully that account's doing well. So I think there's challenges no matter where you go. And it just depends on what kind of challenge you like. And I like the challenge of, I like being the underdog. I like being the little guy. I like getting out there in front of people and showing them like, new stuff like broad vision getting people on on the internet believe it or not in 1998 our meetings were uh, our customers aren't going to trust the internet with their credit card and we would say you know people said that about atm machines and now look you're out at 2 30 in the morning in new york city on a street corner taking money out so happens at 2 30 in the morning when you take out cash that's true but you, you see the point, it was like, and then in Salesforce, it was, you know, there's one code base. This is the democratization of software. You know, anybody can now use it. And that was a different thing, putting your stuff in the cloud. And then the, all these startups I've been at, Mastery was, hey, you know, APIs, if you have APIs, you can open up your business to move so much faster. Those were all newer ideas and it was fun I and mean, it's fun and I like it. And so what we're doing now is, is newer and fun. And I, I like that challenge more than feeling like I don't have as much control over my destiny at a bigger company, but that's just let's, me. Let's dive in a little bit into your, into your hiring strategy, right? Cause you, you know, I met you at Mashery and you know, there were maybe six or seven salespeople and a couple of SDRs. This was 2011, 2012. And you know, it was before, right, right before predictable revenue came out. I know you work with Aaron at Salesforce, but that's for another discussion. Um, you know, when you are hiring today, right, whether you're hiring for, well, let's sort of take each of the roles, right? As a BDR and SDR, what are you looking to hire for? What are you, or what are you teaching your managers to look for to hire for if you have a BDR manager? We are hiring BDRs. We, I don't think there's going to be anything new. We, we've just hired a bunch and I, I think they're great. We, what I loved about troops is they're a New York company and they're doers, like they're hard workers. This is not a startup where you get lunch and breakfast and dinner brought in. It's, it's a real kind of like an old school company. And so the people we attract tend to be people who really want to learn and get good and work hard. And so we look for that work ethic. We do, we do like hiring people that are, that are, in, that are, that've got a good pedigree. You know, if a couple of our recent hires, Michigan, USC, um, they don't have to come from a great school, but you look, that, that does mean something. If you work really hard in high school and you got into a good school and you worked really hard in a good school and you got out, um, I, I wouldn't say that that's a rule. There's also a recruiter in New York now who hires only, who, who represents only BDRs that are athletes from, top 30 schools. So we have a BDR from Princeton and the guy's killer. I use a football player too. And so there is something to be said for that kind of work effort. 
right? But we also look at the personal stories, and I won't go into them, but each of those BDRs that we hired had their own personal story of different types of adversity and things like that that they overcame. So certainly, you know, how do you get back, you know, tell me when you got knocked down and how'd you get back up? Um, because you're going to get, this is a, I actually love this story, right? So I sold to this guy back in 2003 or four at um, Trimble, and it was before GPSs were, before smartphones. And so they sold him a device at GPS on, on vehicles. And so he would go to electricians, plumbers, window repair, people who had, you know, four to eight fleet of trucks. And he'd say, look, if you put these on your car or on your trucks, we'll know, we'll be able to route your people to the next call in the most efficient way. And we'll let you know if they're out on Ocean Beach smoking marijuana for four hours when they're supposed to be on the job, that kind of thing, right? That was all, he hired all 1099 reps and he wrote this book called um, Ready, Set, Sell. And in it, he talks about Pareto and this guy, Don Mastrangelo, he was like so psycho on the 80-20. He'd be like, I can hire five managers, only one's going to work out. I'll hire five reps, only one's going to work out. And so he would, he wanted Salesforce because he wanted to see activity level right away. He's like, you're going to get, and he's like in Pareto and sales, he's like, you're going to get 80 no's for every 20 yeses. And those 20 yeses, only 20 of those are going to be hot and ready to go. 20% of those would be hot and ready to go. So you have, he would actually have a spreadsheet, this big paper with a hundred squares, 96 no's and four yeses. And he would use that as a training mindset for his people and say, you got to get 96 no's to get four yeses. And if you get those 96 no's in a day, obviously you're not, that's too fast. But if you get that in a day versus a quarter, you're going to make a hell of a lot more money. And so he wanted to see the DNA. He wanted to see that the people that he hired would have within a week or two show that velocity to get through those 96 no's, not get beaten down to get to those four yeses. And I've always remembered him in terms of hiring, in terms of I need people who understand that a no is just one no close to a yes and it doesn't demoralize you. That's great. I, I just, the thing I got took out of that story though, is that, you know, you hired me coming out of, you know, from, from the University of Arizona. So uh, seeing U of A and Michigan. I've learned. University. It's been a decade, Richard. I've learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I'm glad I didn't have to get hired. So what, what about, what about, you know, as you, as you think about it from that DNA perspective, I appreciate that. What do you look for when you're looking for an AE and, and, and maybe even to clarify a little bit, at Troops, what's your average, you know, if you're allowed to say, what's your sales cycle like, what's your, what's your ARR, that kind of stuff, so people get a context of what your, the DNA you're hiring for based on your deal size? Well, the DNA that we're looking for is, is still to be determined. You know, we're still young and we're still trying things out, but one of the things that I think is really important is we, we in, when I initially got there, I think it's an evangelical sale, but now I actually don't believe that it's an evangelical sale. I, I, a little bit like people are just starting to learn best practices in Slack and, and we live in Slack. And so our guys have five years of working with Slack. They know Slack better than any company out there, really it, from a, we, we integrate with it, we use it. And so we have a lot of expertise in terms of how to get the best out of Slack. So from that perspective, it's evangelical, but the really, the main thing is, is that it's process reengineering and that's, you know, getting in and figuring out what's going on with your business today. Like, you know, I wrote the, uh, the pain funnel, Richard, you know, right. where you go in and you have to figure out, you know, how do we increase your productivity? How do we help you get better data visibility? How do we give your reps more time to sell? And that's all about being able to uncover what you're, what you're doing today, why it's not sustainable and, and mapping out what the future looks like. So that's really more of a process background. And so I am looking for more senior people who understand that that need to talk to a lot of different people and figure out where you're at today and where you need to be. And, and you know, the jury's still out on how that's going to work. Ask me in a year or two, right? Have you, have you, are you finding that the, the motivation and the goals of the folks that you're interviewing and, <clears throat> and trying to hire now has changed and evolved compared to five, 10, 15 years ago? I'm just thinking, I mean, I, I love the story of Mark Benioff just saying, Hey, my number one rep made 600 grand. However, in today's kind of environment, um, I'm also picturing a world where people could potentially be put off by that, especially younger people who maybe care about things more than just the, uh, the almighty, almighty dollar. So I'm, I'm wondering 
if, if you're finding that, um, like I, I've found it at least, like the goals and motivations of people and what they want out of the role are, are a little different now than they were five, 10, 15 years ago. Are you, are, are you, do you feel like that's the case for you as well? You know, I have listened to one of your previous podcasts where you guys went on this for a long time. I'm not going to dragging be, you into it now. I'm not going to be, it's actually, you know, I, I've been thinking about this since 94 because I went into Accenture much older, you know, four or five years older than most of the other people. And even back then there were people that I looked at that were like, really came to work to want to work and some that, that didn't. And I think that's still true today. And so again, we look for people that, that want to work and grow their career. And if you want more meaning, I mean, we're selling software, right? I mean, we're not, we're not um, the ACLU. We're not, you know, the Gates Foundation reducing infant mor mortality by 50%, which is- we, we, take, we certainly try to take ourselves that seriously. But I, I yeah, I don't. And so I, um, I, I take the impression, the, the point of view that if I'm interviewing somebody, it's because they want to go down a road of getting better. And they want to grow their themselves, and and as much as we can. I mean, you know, our our whole point is we want to make work more human. So we do have an aspect where we want to make work better, and we want to make it more fun, and we want to make it more productive, so people can be more successful. So that is our 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 vision is make work more human. But we also I want people. Are you, are you just are you just showing up in the interview and saying, hey, my number one rep at Troops makes blank. Makes well, no, not yet. They're, they're not at 600 grand yet, but I'd love to. That's <laughs> actually where at, though. 100 yeah, grand, 200 grand. That's one of the biggest things about hiring at a Series A startup is, is that you can't really look back on that and, and say that with even if you only have well, one rep. You can't at all. Look, this is, this, I spent my whole career virtually in the environment of seed stage to Series C, right? And, yeah. you know, like it or not, like you're selling a dream. You're, you're selling the dream of like, I believe this is what you're going to be able to earn now in year one. I believe this is where we're gonna be able to take you in year two and year three, et cetera. I would say that when it comes to hiring reps at, at a series A startup, a lot of time it's, and I love this DNA and I have it and, and, and I never lost it, which is I always feel like I have something to prove. And, and whether it's, I was just at a failed startup before this one, and, and I was at a startup that didn't work out for me before mastery, and I had really had something to prove. And, and I find that when I find people like that, that actually have the right DNA, they, and they have that, they have that, whether it's a chip or it's a, on their shoulder or whether it's a desire, that they have something to prove. I like that a lot. Right. Yeah, I, I, do I, I love the chip on the shoulder. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't let it get unhealthy. Right. But there, I do think that that's, that's what you needed to start up. The person who's like, I'm going to get a huge territory and I'm going to make it rain. Right. Because I'm in control. Like if you're an enterprise rep at troops, you're getting a quarter of the country. Right. And you know, that's a lot, that's a lot of dirt. And if you can, you if you have the right dna and you have that right motivation like the talent code right how do you it's 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 desire um expert coaching it's ignition expert coaching and deep practice right and so if i can find the people with that desire that ignition and i can give them the best coaching i can and they can practice their craft really well through a good process then they should become great at their craft Right. And that's, that's kind of what you have to look for. Cause you can't, you know, the guys that are making five or 600 K at Salesforce year in and year out, you're not going to pull them out. No, well, you, and you don't, you don't want them at, at the very beginning, most likely as well. I mean, you know, first round capital just released like their uh, state of startups, you know, kind of report and, you know, making an impact, solve a problem that makes a difference, important mission, great team to work with strong culture. Like these are the things that, that uh, you know, I think early stage, early stage salespeople are lo are looking for. You know? I love the, I love the first round capital guys. Anything they say, I think is is really worth listening to. Yep. They were they were uh, they were they were were they with Mashery when yeah they were. That, the that was one of the best parts about leaving Salesforce is getting into the startup world and getting this whole nother uh, awareness of people. So Josh Koppelman wrote the first check to Mashery um, to Oren 
after Orange sketched out what mastery was. And so on a, on a I mean, cocktail he, napkin, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and he was on the board for the first couple of years, which was, I mean, just getting to know Josh Kaufman is pretty amazing, right? Yeah. He's, that dude's legit. And Fred Wilson, you know, Orin knew him. And so just meeting a lot of these people who understand the startup world so well. That's another thing. If, if you want to, if you want to, that's an important one, actually. I'm glad you brought that up, Scott, because if you're, a lot of people join a startup because they want to be an entrepreneur. And a yeah. lot of people have come to troops because they want to start their own company someday. Yeah. And our CEO, Dan, has done it before a couple of times. And, and when you get into a series, a startup, you're closer to, to understanding what that takes. And you get that, you get that, um, you get to rub elbows with the, the you know, union square ventures and the first round capitals of the world and really hear about how people do it. And that's a big, that's a big plus for, a lot of people is that hey i want to be a i want to be an entrepreneur and being at a good startup with good connections is a great yeah. way to get there I think a lot of salespeople are more entrepreneurial than they than they realize you know as a salesperson you're you're running your own business right um and I, i'm i'm hoping that you know in the next wave there's more entrepreneurs that have a a, a direct sales background and it's not you know so seemingly dominated by um you know, right. finance and private equity and engineer and product kind of kind of folks. Yeah, I've got I've got two more questions for you. The first one, Rock, is you know I, I made this post on LinkedIn about interviewing the other day, <laughs> and and you know I was I was sort of uh, you know I, you know first of all everybody I think people know I sort of like to take an attitude about things because otherwise LinkedIn gets boring, but the, the premise of it was that you know companies aren't interviewing you, you're interviewing the company. Um, other thoughts that were in there was that, you know, if companies are hiring, in some ways they're desperate for support because they don't, they, something's not getting done until they fill that spot, right? And uh, you were kind enough to send me a really nice note that says, you know, you didn't necessarily agree with a lot of those thoughts, right? So, you know, you know, you, and one of the things you brought up was, well, wait a minute, what if this person has, you know, six failed startup attempts or six, you know, they've had six jobs in four years and, you know, you sort of see that from your perspective, you might see that as a red flag. Um, from my perspective, I, and I think I'll speak for Scott is like, oh, this, this is the person who's hungry. You know, they just had some shitty leadership in some cases, right? I'd love to just sort of get more of your opinion around those kinds of things. Are those really red flags for you? Um, you, know, you know, in today's world, particularly, at least in the startup world and me, I'm in the Bay Area, you know, seeing somebody jump every nine months it's just sort of the norm at this point. And it's up to me if I hire that person to make them not want to leave after nine months. So, well, what are the things you look for in that, in that resume review as you're looking at people just to give people some, a different. So I'm going to parse this because it's two things that you asked. One is that I don't think it's healthy to go into enter, enter, any interview thinking that, you know, you've got hand like in the George Costanza thing. I don't think that's healthy. And going in and thinking, Oh, I'm interviewing you that is not going to come off very well. And, and I think also in this, it worked when you hired me. I don't think you came off that way. Um, I don't think that that's, that's not necessarily a healthy for it, particularly since, you know, you guys have you've got kind of gone on in the millennial thing, et cetera. I don't, I think that that propagates the I'm special a little bit too much. And the fact is, is that you won't, even if you have a need at a startup, I think enough companies have realized that a bad hire is really, really, really costly. That even if work's not getting done, you don't rush a decision like that because you need you need to find the right people. And not all good jobs are good jobs. And the good jobs you want. And if you want you got to earn those good jobs. And so I, I think that that's, that's important. And, and then the second piece is, is that what do I look for in a resume? In my opinion, a sales rep makes their money in years two through four and five. Right? Year one is you're, you're putting in the effort. You're, making, you're, you're doing the things that you need to do to build your franchise. And if you keep seeing people that leave after one to two years, what it says to me is that they actually aren't that good of a rep. Now there's always exceptions. If it's one time or if it's two times over a longer career, that's different. But you know, I was just meeting with a, actually this is great, right? So Matt Thanos 
is Jim Thanos, my broad vision mentor's son. And I just met with him last night and he was at Scout RFP from under a million in ARR and they took it through and they just sold it to Workday. And he was the first guy on the ground that went all the way through. If you go back and look at Matt's background, he got promoted twice at Salesforce and I think, or maybe three times and then before he left and then went to Twitter and I think he probably got another promotion then. So this is a guy who stuck around, grounded out. And by the way, you build relationships that way. If you keep leaving after a year or two or under two years, who's really your sponsor? Who's really like my, my hope is that anybody that works for me or with me never has another cold interview because we've done good stuff together. And regardless of how the company panned out, if they need a reference, I can speak very specifically to the things that they do well, that's going to help them get hired. And, and you don't build that in a year or two. You build that by going through tough times together with people. And so I just think for sales reps who leave jobs under two years consistently over and over again, I mean, Richard, you, you responded back and say, what if they've had crappy leadership? I'm like, well, six times, you know the story. If somebody breaks up with you and it's like the fifth person to break up with you, it's probably not them, it's probably you, right? It's so, I think that you have to look in the mirror and figure out what's, what am I doing that's getting in my way? And believe me, there's nobody that has more self-inflicted gunshot wounds than me. And so um, I just think that that's a really important thing is to get into a company and show growth and success and, and, and that kind of thing. That's great. I, I appreciate a different perspective. So thank you for sharing that. Um, one last question is, uh, you know, particularly you get, in, you get into the treadmill, right? You, you've been through mastery, you've been through, uh, you're going through it with troops and, what, what do you do to stay sane? What are the things you do to stay healthy? I know, I know you're married and you have kids and you're putting a lot of energy there. What, what are the hobbies that you, that you use to just keep yourself grounded? The kids are now teenagers, so they take actually a lot less time because they're not really that interested in that anymore. Um, Richard and I are slightly looking forward to that phase. <laughs> <laughs> it goes fast. Uh, I, I'm going to not... I know we're running out of time, so I won't have to get too touchy feely, but honestly, I've actually spent the last year with kind of like a life coach slash therapist. So the thing that's gotten me going now is, is trying to, you know, figure out myself and how to be better and how to, you know, just be a better person, better leader. And it's, I don't mean to be all, you know, I hit rock bottom or anything like that. It's just like, well, what, what do I got to do to, to, to keep, getting better and I'll leave you on this story like so in two years ago I was I turned 50 and I went and I was going to London every month for a week so while I was there the Tate Modern had a Picasso exhibit it was 1932 uh, Picasso's 50th year and people had written off Picasso ah, he's driving around a limo he's not hungry anymore he's you know he's got a mistress he's got two houses he's rich um, even his closest friends and critics were like, ah, he's kind of done. And they offered him a retrospective, which was only the second living artist to get one a year after Matisse, who was his friendly rival. And, and he spent the first half of 1932, and Picasso was one of those artists who was incredibly prolific. He could do two or three paintings in a couple of days, sculptures, and he was remarkable, right? And then he came out in, in, the, in June, I think it was, and he did the whole thing. He, he set up the, the pieces of work. He chose them. He put them all out. And, and people were like, holy crap, Picasso is back. And Picasso went on to have 40 more years of prolific creation of beautiful art. And he had that at 50 years old. And I'm walking through, and I love Picasso. I really love Picasso. But none of the pieces really stood out to me. What stood out to me was that here I was 50. I'm on my third startup not going very well I'm mean, kind of like had a little brown out and um and I just walked through and saw this guy who had done so much more than almost any human ever and he still found that fire to have 40 more years of, of elite production and so that kind of like was a, that was kind of like a kick in the pants for me to say okay I'm 50 you know, my kids will be gone in a few years what do I want to do for the next 40 years that's going to matter? And that kind of led me down the path of, you know, Untethered Soul, which I think is a really good book, just to kind of just figure your own stuff out, get out of your own way. Because really nobody's in your way more than you. And so um, 
yeah, so that's it. I mean, the last year has been like, how do I get better? And it's, believe me, it's, it's one step forward, five steps. Back. Have you found a new hobby? Have you found something? Are you trying things? Are you painting? Well, that's it. I mean, that's actually, that actually mental health and, you know, taking care of yourself takes a lot of time. It yeah. actually does. And, and exercise, right? You mind, you, you put that together with exercise and you try to eat right, you know, try to live a long life and try to be healthy. Like, I want to be able to hike and do stuff for a long period of time. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that I do. And so... Yeah, that's it. That's great. So, well, Rock, thank you so much for for being on with with Surf and Sales. Um, you know, I've asked you before, and I'll, I'll ask you again. You know, are you are you finally ever going to break down and come with us to Costa Rica or Mexico? Our next one's going to be in Mexico in May. But you know, are you? Every time I ask you, you're like, I don't surf. Well, now that you're on this end moment, right? Like this is the perfect time for me to close you. Right. I'm listening. I'm doing my active listening. So do you know, the funny thing is, is that I'm such like I have such a puritanical upbringing. Right. It's like I don't take a lot of days off. And so I, that's really like it's like, how can I justify that? It's like, how can I? So I'll ask you, you know, what's the you know, give me the, the pitch that I can give to Dan, my CEO, that says I need to be gone this week. Here's what I'm going to learn and bring back. Because um, believe me, I'd love to go. I'd love to go surf and sail, hike and sail, trek and sail, you know. No, it sounds it sounds to me like the issue is more with you than it is with Yeah, you gotta get out of your own way, probably right? right. You're That's probably true. right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Scott. It's true. I'll leave you with that. So <laughs> That's a good one. The so here's the deal. I, I will I will pitch it out as best I can and Scott will jump in. So uh, you know, in case you couldn't tell, I'm not I'm not the major surfer. Scott and Jeff are the major surfers. <laughs> um, but you know, we spend anywhere from three to four hours doing surfing, right? It includes lessons. So if you've never surfed before, every day you've got a surf lesson so that you can figure it out. Usually by the end of day one, everybody's up on the board anyway. It's not some long process to learn. Um, But the other time we're really sitting around um, doing some content that's been uh, cultivated by us, but also from attendees. So for example, Rock, you could come in and talk about something you're really passionate about in sales or leadership so that others can learn from you. Um, and that, and, and then the rest of the time is you are spending time with like-minded sales related individuals. So you're getting to have those longer, deeper conversations that you can't do at Dreamforce, right? You're breaking bread with these people. You're sharing personal stories where you do a session on how to tell a story like storytelling um, and it gets, it gets really deep and you have these intimate relationships that are going to last forever. Um, much, you know, kind of like how yours and I have, have occurred over, over the years, but it's not a bro fest. It's not a drunk fest. It's not a, let's just go on the beach and, and smoke weed kind of thing. It, it's pretty much the opposite of that. You know, if we're getting up and surfing at seven in the morning, you know, you're not staying out till one o'clock at night partying, right? Like it's not that kind of an event. And Scott, you can, Scott's really much better at, at pitching the dream. So I'll let Scott explain a little bit and then we'll, then we'll jump off of here. So uh, I don't know. I don't have to pitch the dream. Rock, Rock already said that he's working on himself and he's working on his health and his mental health. He already said that he has a puritanical issue with taking time off. Right. So it's a perfect opportunity for him to work on these kind of things. If you don't think that part of the, uh, experience is physical health mental health getting into a a a beautiful setting with like-minded individuals um you know you got you got another thing coming right and and well there's no there's no uh there's no event that i'd rather go to i can tell you that much well he's moved from puritan to like you know whatever is one step above that so he's getting he's moved up the farm so at any rate Great Scott, it was a real pleasure to meet you. I've, I've yeah, heard your yeah. name for a decade, I think. And Richard, yeah. it's always good to catch up, man. Thank you so much always for a pleasure, man. listening to old the old story. I feel like I'm like Tony Kornheiser, old man radio. Yeah. <laughs> 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 cool. Talk again soon. Take care, guys. Bye.